that was a great way that we used to reset, grab our backpacks, and then we would leave San Francisco, which was incredibly expensive. And we would go away to a country where it was a lot more affordable to get around. Welcome to the 11th episode of How I Built My Small Business, the show that is dedicated to sharing the insight that entrepreneurs have about how to start and grow small businesses. I'm Ann McGinty, your host, And today, I have a special episode for you. My husband, Mark, will be co-hosting the episode as we reflect on what it was like starting and running a Christmas light installation business together. Hey, everybody. Back in 2006, when we started our business, now known as San Francisco Holiday Lighting, Inc., we bootstrapped it because we didn't have much money to get started. And it was profitable from our first season, albeit a bit clunky for years. But gradually, we fell into a rhythm, learned how to divide and conquer, and our business experienced exponential growth all the way until we sold it in 2020. I ended up handling the sales team, bidding jobs, the communication with clients, and scheduling. Mark would say, just book the work and I'll make sure it gets done. He ran operations and was in charge of all of the installation teams, which by the end was six teams and about 20 people. From start to finish, Running the business was a whirlwind with many highs, including lighting iconic landmark areas that brought people together over the holidays, building a core leadership team, and of course, the significant profit. But that always came with a handful of lows, such as dodging rain and the backlog of scheduling that would cause a revolving door of seasonal employees and a few challenging clients. We also expanded our business at the same time as our family, which is now five of us. I'll include a link to the business in the episode's description. So let's dive in. One question that I know we've been asked repeatedly is, how did you even get into the business of hanging Christmas lights? I'll start us off before I hand off the baton. So back in 2006, I was working for a body and oral care company as a sales representative in the Bay Area. In a nutshell, I went to every grocery store a natural goods retailer between San Francisco, Monterey, and Fresno, and either made appointments in advance or showed up and asked to speak with the buyer to try and get them to carry new lines of product and to schedule demos where you hand out free samples. My back hurt. I was getting tired of driving around so much, and my paycheck and bonuses were capped. So there really wasn't any incentive to go above and beyond. At least that's how I felt. Anyway, One of my coworkers told me how her cousin in Southern California was making six figures, putting up Christmas lights and working a couple months a year. She was a very good saleswoman, and I didn't really believe her at the time, but I mentioned it to Mark later that day. Mark, why don't you tell them what happened next? Sure. So I had been roped into doing a demo at the Whole Foods, where I would pretty much stand there for two hours and ask people if they'd like a free sample of toothpaste. And lo and behold, there was another girl that was representing a different company that was right next to me. Inadvertently, I ended up chatting away and she found out that I did a little bit of construction and I was up on ladders. And it turned out that her boyfriend lived in the county that was just north of us and he put up Christmas lights for a living. And I think this was in the space of a two week window when Anne had an independent referral to this business and then I had an independent referral to this business. You came home from the demo. And you said, you're never going to believe what happened today. And I was like, what? What is it? And he said, well, the girl who was handing out Lara bars next to me at Whole Foods, she said that her boyfriend puts up Christmas lights and makes six figures a year in a couple months. And I was like, seriously? That's twice in like two weeks. So we started looking into it. We didn't know anything beyond Well, that sounds like a lot of fun, working just a few months a year and making enough to live off of. (laughs) Let's look into this. And we found a company called the Christmas Light Pros, and they were selling licenses to operate underneath their name. It was very different to a franchise. They were basically selling the use of their incorporated name, access to a group of established installers around the nation, comprehensive training, and a 1-800 number that would funnel calls that came in from specific zip codes 
straight to our cell phones. And for us, this was worth it because when we stumbled upon the idea, it was already August and the season was quickly approaching. And this provided us with a shortcut to the know-how. So we went down to San Diego and we proceeded to go through the basics of Christmas light installation. We did some basic calculations on loads because if you plug too many Christmas lights in together, they stop working. I think Anne separated off from me while I was getting taught all the install techniques and she was focused on how to write up estimates. Learning from them gave me a really good foundation, a base from which to grow from. but. From that point forward, we really started to change how we did things to suit our own desires and needs and custom craft how we wanted to go about it. Once we got back to the Bay Area, got a business license, got our website working, and we needed a work truck, we needed ladders, and a general level of inventory to get started. We actually borrowed some equipment from a contractor who was very nice to just offer us a few ladders, extension ladders, just to get us going. It's called Red Hill Painting in San Francisco. I don't remember what the connection was, if we had them do some work for us or something. We didn't have any money. We didn't have any money. We didn't have a house, actually. I have no idea how we made that connection. I was working for a contractor. And they had a painter on site that was finishing up the residence for these guys. And he had a bit of an Irish accent. And so I just connected with him straight away. And we just started making jokes around the work site pretty much. But yeah, so when, when it came time and I told them that I was finishing up working for these guys because I had to put my notice in because well, I was going to go hang Christmas lights, he just offered. It was amazing. That was really nice of them. Yeah, super, super supportive. So Mark went on Craigslist and found, what was it, like a $1,400 box truck? It was a very cheap box truck. It was good enough to go and drive. It lasted the season. It did its job, except for when it broke down. We got a phone call at one point because my buddy was stuck in traffic in a broken down <laughs> truck. I laughed, but it actually was super stressful at the time. And we ended up having to rent a truck from a local company just to make ends meet. So we had a box truck and needed to get some branding put on the outside, but we didn't have enough money to get it professionally wrapped. So we printed stencils in Word document, one letter to a page, cut them out and brought a couple of cans of red spray paint into a remote park of Park Presidio where we could tape up the stencils and, and spray the side of our truck. We went to the extent of putting some 12 volt Christmas light wrapped garland around the top and lit that up for when we weren't using the vehicle. We would park the truck in some of the most affluent areas of San Francisco, parked in prime position as a billboard. I would park it up there overnight. Yeah. Much to the annoyance of the neighbors, <laughs> probably. But, I don't know. but you couldn't help but notice it, I think, in its location. Rewinding just a little bit, as I had mentioned, we didn't have any money, really, to get this started. So... We used a credit card with no interest for 21 months and spent about $18,000 to get up and running that first season. At this point, we had a truck, but we didn't have any clients. So Mark and I printed out two early installation flyers per page and printed out, I don't know, maybe like 100 of these. And the advertisements offered a 15% off labor for early bookings. Have your lights installed before Thanksgiving. We picked a neighborhood where we wanted to work. It was that same neighborhood where we parked the truck and started walking around, dropping off flyers at these multi-million dollar mansions. And it wasn't even two hours and we got our first call. And you and I were walking around the block in opposite directions and then meeting up on the other side. And my phone started ringing and I was like, is there any possibility? And just in case, I picked up the call and said, this is Anne at the Christmas Light Pros. Would you like to schedule a free estimate? And to my great surprise, they said, yes. <laughs> I was psyched. So I met with the client the next day and gave the impression that our calendar was getting booked up, even though we literally did not have a single job on the calendar at that point. And I got her booked for installation on November 4th. 
We set up a pre-programmed timer, left the lights unplugged, and just told her to plug them in when she was ready to have them start turning on. So we installed that day, and the neighbors saw the box truck parked outside her house, and more requests for estimates started rolling in. I mean, it was incredible advertising. From November 7th until December 15th, we were booked every single day. But that season was not without its challenges. We thought we were smooth sailing. I think it was the week after Thanksgiving. We were so psyched. Two more weeks of installs to go. We were calculating how much we were going to make. And I mean, this was just mind boggling to us. And then it rained. And then the service calls started rolling in. And I think that first torrential rain of the first season. And I kid you not, I think that I got like 23 service calls all on the same day calling in. My lights aren't working. And you and I were a bit dumbfounded, right? We didn't know what was going on. So we had to problem solve any possible issues in our Christmas light system. So you'd be working from where the lights were plugged into the trees through any sort of connection that might be lying on the ground all the way up into the trees and inspecting each individual bulb. So when it came to mini lights or other different types of products that we would use, it quickly became a very complicated process. And at the beginning and for years, it was all incandescent lights because LED Christmas lights hadn't really been developed to the quality that they are today. Let me tell you, incandescent is a completely different game than LED when it comes to Christmas light installation. So getting back to solving that influx of service calls, you guys went out. It was 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock at night sometimes. And you went and you fixed all the problems. You found the broken bulbs or you found the connections that were loose and you guys got the lights all working again quite often within 30 minutes right someone would call in and within 30 minutes we could be on their doorstep attempting to fix the issue definitely at the beginning we didn't have as many clients as we did towards the end within 30 minutes is an extremely quick turnaround time for, yeah. <laughs> for sure but we were working for ourselves and we were motivated to make sure that we did the best possible job, right? Yeah, we wanted our clients to really know and understand that their happiness with our service was of utmost importance. And I'd pick up the call and I would listen. They would tell me what the problems were. But I would also not tell them that, hey, I've got 23 service calls just like yours. I would say, let me get somebody out there to take care of that right away. Because I didn't want to give the impression that we're, hey, we're a new business. We don't really know how to problem solve yet. We needed them to believe in our desire to just do a good job. So I made sure to ameliorate their concerns and Mark took care of it. That first season, we brought in about $156,000. And we still took a two-week holiday for Christmas. And we had all of the lights down by January 6th. And then from there, the business just continued to grow every single year. We had an 85% retention rate. And I remember that every year we would calculate this because we would know if we dipped below an 85% retention rate, well, then something was wrong. Either we weren't providing the service to the level that we needed to, or it was too expensive. That was always a metric that we were able to use just to validate that we were doing things the right way. I'd like to say, too, that it also allowed us to plan and forecast, right? Yeah. So you could take that 85% and then use that as a multiplier on your income or gross revenue. And then you could work out approximately how much you thought you might grow next year. And then you could plan for how many staff that you'd need, how many vehicles that you'd think you'd need, like how busy you were going to be and when you should start booking work. And the other helpful thing was that we had our client list from the prior season. And so when the next season was approaching, I could contact all of them and incentivize them to book even earlier. Because the earlier we could get people to book their jobs, the longer our Christmas lighting season would be, and the more profitable it would be as well. Without having to ramp up to 12 teams in a, say, six-week period, we could continue to have six teams and operate for three months. Yeah, which also helped with like employee retention. Yeah, exactly. 
because then we had a longer stretch that we were employing these individuals for and so then we could pay them more dollar-wise across the entire season. So then it became more financially viable for these awesome people that worked for us. That was so challenging to figure out how do you find and train employees seasonally? Because at the beginning, it was only a six-week season. We had to find people who usually had never done this type of work before and train them. And that was such an investment of time to get people up to speed to where we needed them to be. We tried to encourage employee retention because then my job of re-educating and retraining and getting our new hires up to speed became substantially easier because now I'm just dealing with a minority. And then also I have experienced people on hand that can demonstrate different techniques. We would offer people a signing bonus just for returning. Yeah, and that was substantial. Like I think it was in the thousands of dollars. Right? Exactly. So just return and come and work a season for us. And that was your bonus, although we wouldn't pay it until the end because we didn't want to give people a signing bonus to show up and then have them disappear in the middle of the season. So we really needed to keep that incentive there. On top of that, we did a bonus structure for the full season as well. And that was more of a performance oriented bonus, right? Yeah. You and I called our friend who worked in human resources, and she was familiar with all of these different bonus structures. And we asked her, what do you think we should do? And she said, well, you could do a 15 to 20% bonus and base it on individual performance, team performance, and then company performance. So... As soon as we learned that method, we implemented it straight away. You never know who's in your friend network. You should look around if you're looking and interested in starting a business for people that have done things and just ask their advice. You're right. There's always going to be something that someone does better than you. And you should take that opportunity to ask that person and learn from them. So don't be afraid about something that you don't know how to do. So going back a little bit and rewinding to that first season... We worked seven days a week, sometimes 16 hour days, and I was out there installing lights with the crew and Mark, and we really learned efficiencies on pre-preparing supplies and installing faster, but to the same quality and how to install in a way that makes takedown way faster. Yeah. And so you develop these efficiencies, right? Yeah. And sometimes a job that would take, say, four hours to install, you could have the lights down in what, 30 minutes? Yeah, for sure. And because we were operating in San Francisco, we were able to be very methodical about how we scheduled our jobs. I always tried to book neighbors on the same day. Or if there was a residence, say, a block away, I would try to group the jobs together so that the team didn't have to move very far and have that opportunity cost from transit between job sites. And then when we moved from one team to eventually six... I also tried to keep the teams together just in the event that one of the team leads forgot to grab a supply from the warehouse. And if they were missing, say, timers, extension cords, SPT wire or plugins, there was a good possibility that one of the other teams was just down the road and they could skip away a few blocks and get what they needed from them. It took us a moment to figure that out because at the beginning, we would take any job that came around, even if it was an hour and a half away. And that was just because we needed the work in the calendar. We had the space and we needed the money. At the time, our minimum was only a $250 labor minimum. And as we grew, we changed it to a $500 labor minimum and then $750 and then $1,000. We stopped at a $1,000 labor minimum, but we did make any jobs that were over a 30-minute drive away from San Francisco a $1,500 labor minimum. And that's really because there is so much lost opportunity in that driving time. And if we could keep our customers close together, our teams were functioning at their highest capacity and we didn't have that lost opportunity. Yeah, that unproductive time, right? Yeah. I remember that first season we were living in that tiny apartment. I think it was maybe, maybe 600 square feet. And we were living in a warehouse. We had boxes that were stacked from the floor to the ceiling in just about every single room. And even in the kitchen where the cabinets have a little bit of that space above them, we would tuck boxes up there because we were bursting at the seams. We were eating, breathing, and sleeping Christmas lights while we learned. I was able to have a better idea of how to quote jobs because I had installed them before. Because that first year, maybe even the first two or three, 
I knew how long things would take. Oh, Anne would be up there climbing trees. I was fast because I was motivated. So speaking to that, like, how did you keep everybody motivated on the team to work at top speed and not just dawdle? I think part of that comes back to the culture, right? So initially, our key people were very focused on moving fast. And you were definitely the fastest out of everyone. I mean, if you were ever actually working a job, which towards the end, I feel like you were really overseeing in an operational way. But when you were installing and you would sub in as the team lead, you were like three times as fast. I remember one of those houses that I did. I think we were short people. And so I ended up going to decorate a house that was up in Pacific Heights. And it was a beautiful house, but it was on a steep slope in San Francisco. And I was using multiple extension ladders. I think I had a 32-foot extension ladder and a 24-foot extension ladder and then a six-foot step ladder. And I smashed this house out. I installed all of their Christmas lights, scrambling up on roofs. I had to go up through a balcony and, and sit on a roof edge and do a section. And at the end of it, I think I completed the job in about an hour and a half, maybe two hours. It would take a team of three guys. I mean, you were really practiced at that point. You had been doing light installs for years. There was a lady that came out. I don't know if you know this, but she came out of the apartment across the street just to say how impressed she was with how <laughs> fast I was. She was honestly, she was blown away. She's like, you put those Christmas lights up so fast. Some people listening are probably thinking, how did you know how to price the jobs? Because Mark could install it by himself in two hours while a team of three could do it in four hours. There's obviously some discrepancy there. We couldn't just price based on Mark because he was only one person. And as the owner of the business, he was extra motivated. Plus, he had some experience using ladders and tools as he lived in London for a few years working that way. So we always priced based on a team of three. Just sitting here and reminiscing about this together is bringing up so much. Most people that we met thought that we were absolutely nuts. They were like, you're going to do what? You're going to start a Christmas light hanging business? I think most people felt like there wasn't any possibility that we would be able to make a substantial livable salary doing that. And we didn't go into it expecting to, but we knew that it was better than what I was getting paid selling toothpaste. And, you know, it was better than what you were earning working construction. Sure. And then once the lights were down at the end of the season, you and I would pack up and we would go overseas for months. That was a great way that we used to reset, grab our backpacks, and then we would leave San Francisco, which was incredibly expensive. And we would go away to a country where it was a lot more affordable to get around. We booked tickets overseas for something like four months. And we subletted our apartment while we were away. And I think we came back with almost the same amount of money that we left with because we didn't have the overhead of rent in San Francisco. Yeah. And our budget, I think per day, we budgeted $20 each a day for one of the countries that we went to. And I think we struggled to spend $20 between us. Yeah, we did. Yeah. And that was for accommodation and food and all of the activities that we were doing. I mean, we weren't staying at five-star resorts and we were also choosing the $3 a night hostel over the $20 a night hostel. Sure. So when you take into account your rent, your lattes, your car parking, your gas, everything else that you're covering on a day-to-day -day basis by living in a developed country, you can cut those costs substantially. We would come back and feel just really reinvigorated to tackle another season and to get started on figuring out how are we going to do it even bigger and better this year. And I don't even think we ever spent any money on marketing. All of the growth was entirely word of mouth. We didn't do any magazines. We did, though, get... Do you remember we had that reporter call us on Thanksgiving Day? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, I do. And you and I were sitting in that 600 square foot apartment. And because it was our first season, we didn't leave town because we didn't have a clue how we would do that. We were like, oh, we need to be here for the day after Thanksgiving because that's big. We need to start installing lights. And But that was mainly because we were it, right? We, we were it. Yeah, exactly. Like you <laughs> <laughs> We were the business. So if we left town, yeah, business was leaving town too. 
But this reporter called on Thanksgiving Day, and I assumed that it was somebody calling for Christmas lights. And I picked up the phone, as I always did. This is Anne at the Christmas Light Pros. And the reporter took a gasp. <gasps> Wait, you're actually open? I honestly, I didn't expect to get a real live person. I can't believe that you're open on Thanksgiving Day. Oh, this is even better. She interviewed me right then and there and told me that the newspaper article was going to be coming out sometime around the second week or so of December. And <laughs> to my surprise, I was so excited. I told my parents. And then when the article came out, the title literally said, even in the rain, they light the lights. And I was <laughs> like, wait, that was the best title you could come up with? I mean, I thought we talked about so much more. It was more exciting than that. And then a second article came out and it was like, Bay Area roof lines go dark as holiday lighting installers deal with the rain. I mean, everything was so negative. And I was like, oh, great. But they say any press is good press. And one piece of good press did come out of that. And the San Francisco Chronicle magazine called us and asked if they could feature us as the owners of a Christmas light hanging business because it seemed like a relatively new concept in the area. And they met with us. And Mark is a very candid person. <laughs> He's from New Zealand. <laughs> very honest, really good ethics. I'm trying to highlight you before I just yeah, say what yeah, you said. Yeah, go on. <laughs> and then they asked... What would people in New Zealand think of what you're doing hanging Christmas lights? And I kid you not, and they printed this, and he said, Oh, they'd think it was a load of rubbish. If they were going to put up Christmas lights, they'd just do it themselves. I think I said they'd laugh, surely. I'm pretty sure this article is still around. Maybe I'll even link to it mm, in the description yeah. of this episode so people can just go and check it out. <laughs> I'd like to say Kiwis are very cost conscious people. <laughs> I think they'd like to save a dollar if they can save a dollar. That I will give you because the cost of living over there is significantly higher in comparison to the wages. Yeah, but, <laughs> but, but in our defense too, you can save your money and put it somewhere else that's more productive. I didn't realize at the time, but that magazine actually has a really large circulation. And we started getting a lot of calls after that. And multiple people said, well, they would literally, they would call in laughing and they would say, I knew when I read what Mark had to say that you guys are good people. I'm going to have you put my lights up because I know you're honest. Because who in their right mind would say something like that in a news article? <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> so, Mark, what to you was the most challenging job that we had? We were subcontracted to come in and do the lighting portion of the job. We did an amusement park. It's a huge park with multiple areas. And so we were moving large pieces of equipment past roller coasters through kiosks and these entertainment areas. And I've got multiple people working in this job site and we needed to be safe. We needed to be efficient and we needed to be able to get the lights up in a way that was going to be representative of who we were as a business. This was about a month long install for our entire team. And I remember writing up the work order by day, by team, and by area of the park based on your input. But you also had to juggle the logistics of the supplies because we weren't providing them. And it's not like the supplies were where they were supposed to be when they were supposed to be. And so the first time we worked with this company, I was literally driving around the entire park looking for pallets of goods that had been placed in some of the most obscure parts of this amusement park. We hadn't budgeted for that. So I was completely distracted driving around. And then I also had teams of guys that were trying to install lights, running out of equipment, running out of supplies. It was really hard. Subsequent to that year, which we did a great job, I might add, uh, because they had us come back, which I think is proof that we did a good job. And the following year, the amusement park contacted us directly and didn't go through the contractor who was subbing to us anyway. That actually didn't have anything to do with our doing. They just reached out to us directly. When we came to take all the lights down, we were very fastidious about packing, stacking, labeling all of the supplies so we knew exactly what we had, where it was, and where it was supposed to go when we came to turn around and install it the following year. This was before we knew that we would be coming back. 
whether they brought us back or they hired another person or they did it in-house, we wanted them to know exactly where everything was in a coherent fashion because that is just a good business practice to treat your clients how you would want to be treated if it were the other way around. Yeah. Also, too, if you can see it stacked up and if you can see it all created and organized, it's very easy to evaluate what you have on hand what potentially you need to reorder for the following season too, right? So as far as like running their business and making sure that the company was organized for the upcoming Christmas season, they could do an assessment on their own without too much stress or hassle. After the first year, it got easier and easier to do. And it expanded as well. That was partly too, because now we had all the supplies and everything on hand to maximize our efficiency in certain areas before we started. There were all these processes that you want to put in place for a big install like that, that you get everyone together and you focus on one area and then you just get that area done. And when you combine teams of people together, there's almost like a multiplying effect of productivity. Now that we've sold the business, what would you say you miss the most? Just the people that we, that we got to work with. Yeah, just amazing people. I think our team appreciated that we really tried to be good employers. Even when we made mistakes, they knew we had good intentions. And we always aimed to pay really high wages, which benefited our employees. But it also benefited our company. As the season started working out to six months a year, we really couldn't afford to have our entire team disappear and not come back the next season because it would have just been impossible to train that many people to start against. And so we effectively ended up paying the value of a full year's salary for six months worth of work for our key players. And that was okay to us because then it meant that the employees were able to suffice for the off season and feel ready to come back for the next season as well. I always felt like when we had a large percentage of our employees that would return, it enabled us to focus our energy instead of training and getting staff up to speed. We were able to take that energy and apply it to our customers and maybe generating new leads. So as our business grew, how did you feel comfortable quoting to these larger commercial jobs? Of the commercial jobs that I bid, I won most of them, 90% or more. And I knew that I could do this for several reasons. One is that when we would show up, first of all, we would show up on time because I think it's really important to set a precedent with clients that you respect their time. And if you make an appointment, either show up on time or early. That worked for all of our Christmas light installs too, right? Yeah. Yeah, we always were very conscientious of making sure that our teams, if they were going to be late, would have to call the customer and client and let them know exactly how long that they would be. That's right, because it's better to give more information than less. If you say, hey, we're running behind schedule, I just wanted to give you a heads up, it's way better than showing up two hours late without them having any notice at all. You're going to have a, an upset customer. So more communication rather than less. But anyway, so when we would go to these larger commercial jobs to bid them, when we would get there, I would greet the client and shake hands and try to establish some sort of a connection with them. For example, how long have you been living in the Bay Area? Or what have you done at the site in the past? What did they like and not like? And what are you looking to do this year? So those types of questions, just trying to get a feel for their end goal. Were they trying to draw people there? Was this for their employees or to create Instagrammable moments? What was the end goal? For us in that moment, it was to try to get to know our clients. So we would walk the site and first ask the clients if they had ideas, because sometimes they really did. And if they did have ideas, we could talk about them further and figure out exactly, you know, how high up do you want the lights to go? Because if somebody says, well, I want to light this tree, it's like, okay, do you want to light the trunk to six feet or do you want to light the tree to 20 feet? Because that's a really big difference. And do you want the spacing to be one inch or do you want it to be three inches or do you want it to be really long and just want it to have like gentle sparkle throughout? And so I would write all of these details down very specifically in each section so that when they got the quote, there was just no room for discrepancy. And I remember at one of these larger jobs that we got, that was about a half a million dollar project. And 
they told us about halfway through the site walkthrough, you are by far the most organized person that has come to bid this job to date. And there was a very good probability that we were going to be awarded the job. And I asked out of curiosity, if you don't mind me asking how many other people have come to visit the site. And they said that three other companies had already come. And I said, well, what did they lack? I wanted just a little bit more clarification as what they were talking about. And they said, well, for one of them, it was a one page quote that said the number of Christmas lights and a vague description of the park and then a dollar amount. Another bid didn't ask any questions about logistics and power sources. And the third they thought was exorbitantly high. To give you an idea of the comparison, my quote for this job ended up being about 15 to 20 pages and was accompanied with satellite maps that corresponded to each section of the written bid, a separate price per section, and details on how many strands, bulbs, extension cords, and a description of how power would be run, plus a custom crafted email explaining how wonderful it was to meet with them and how we would be honored to be selected. These competitors were just wholly unprepared for what they were getting into. At the very least, somebody wants to know what they're paying for. For sure. And then, well, subsequently too, if you were awarded the job, what do you have that's going to allow you to be able to do the job for the client too, if you have no notes? Totally. We always aim to provide full transparency for the client. And I really whittled it down so that it would also be easy to create a work order if approved. On top of that, it made ordering super easy. But growing the business had positives and negatives. At one point, one of our operations leads asked if we would be open to some feedback. And he said, I think you would really benefit from doing exit interviews at the end of every season just to keep a better pulse on what's happening on the ground. And so we did that. And we learned so much about the team, about the culture, about what employees liked and what they didn't like. We learned how to best schedule our teams for maximum efficiency and camaraderie. And we were able to adjust and improve our operations based on employee feedback. Everybody always said that you were such a good manager, such a good boss. So something you were doing was really sitting well with the employees. What do you believe contributed to the positive feedback and high satisfaction expressed by the crew about working with you as their boss? Yeah. I think that comes from an exposure to a wide variety of peoples, right? And so I think as long as you respect each individual for who they are and what they bring to the table, you know, maybe they don't have the same education or they didn't have the same upbringing or they didn't have the same opportunities. Yeah, I think that you are able to make people feel at ease. We had an employee that came back after taking a break for quite a few years, I think. But when he came back, he said he mainly came back because I was such a good boss to him. And I'm always amazed at how people will put up working for an individual that's just not very nice. Yeah. Well, I'm not going to mention any names, but I remember when you were working for somebody. I've had lots of sucky bosses. And you accidentally broke something on the job site. Oh, that's right. I was carrying solid oak doors down a three-story walk-up, beautiful house in San Francisco, all the way down to their garage. And I swung it around a corner and knocked a light fixture that she had hanging. And this light fixture, believe it or not, was over a $1,000. And your boss told you that as the employee, you had to pay for the fixture, even though he had insurance. And at the time, I don't think you and I had anywhere near that in savings. No. And you came home so upset about it. But I think having that experience also made you a more empathetic leader. If we were to do this again, which we wouldn't, mainly because we're just at a different stage in our life, right? Like, I don't have any desire to start this back up again. If I had to. If I had to, but we're not in the need to. But Let's say our kids decided, hey, I want to do that. I like the lifestyle you guys have created. What tips would you give them? I'd say efficiency is very key. The more efficient that you can be, if you're going to climb up on a roof, you take everything that you need. So you're not running and expending energy going up and down, up and down. When you're doing sort of a labor oriented job, the more energy that you're having to throw out there to get that job done, the more tired you're going to be, the more tired you're going to be the next day and the next day after that until eventually you get to a point where you're just exhausted. Eventually, it's going to lead to you know a loss of productivity. What would you say? I'd say that learning how to problem solve is really important and also learning how to build relationships because 
a lot of people think that sales is intimidating or they'll say, I'm not a salesperson. And if you're good at making friends and you're good at getting to know people and listening to people, well, then you are a salesperson because sales has nothing to do with trying to get somebody to buy something. I mean, in theory, that is the end goal, but you get there by getting to know them and by trying to give them what it is that they want and need it. And you just remove the greed from the situation. If the service is something that they want for the price that you're quoting, well, great. And if you are over quoting, you're going way too high because you want to make a bigger profit on that job, the chances are that the client will probably be able to see straight through that, that your motivation is based on your own needs and wants rather than theirs. And that just doesn't work as well. So building relationships is the core component of being good at sales. You shouldn't sell yourself off for too cheap too, right? Because eventually you just won't be that enthusiastic about going to complete that job because you realize that it's not really financially worthwhile anymore for you to do that, right? There was one year when we went through all of our jobs and worked out what the profitability was on each of them as our team and expenses had grown. And some of them were probably a break even. And that was a hard thing to swallow. I mean, we had to go through and significantly increase some of those clients' job prices because we had initially underbid them. Sure. And we hadn't increased their job prices since we'd initially started, right? We just kept rolling that that quote over and over again to a point where I think gas prices had left us behind. Our wages had gone up. All of our costs. Insurance had gone up and we hadn't increased prices. Yeah. And doing that always feels a little bit uncomfortable, but we hadn't increased prices in probably about seven or eight years. And that created a problem because we had to increase the job prices significantly and suddenly. And I crafted emails individually to all of the clients to explain what their job price was going to go to. And for some of them, the job price was doubling. And it felt so awful to do that. But at the same time, I just explained that our operations have grown. We're paying higher salaries now so that we can continue to have employees stick around. The cost of lights and supplies has gone up. Fuel has gone up. I mean, insurance has gone up. Everything has gone up. And... I should have been increasing prices gradually along the way instead of making this giant leap seven years later. So that is another lesson that I think others could benefit from. If you are in a service business and you haven't increased your prices for a while, it's okay to do it, but do it in smaller increments than what we did. Do you remember too, we had that client, it was a commercial streetscape where we would do quite a intense installation over two blocks, shall we say. Yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. And the job itself was incredibly complicated. And they balked at the price one year and they decided to go with another vendor. That's right. Yeah. But only for a year. <laughs> <laughs> I think subsequently that vendor took... I think they took three times as long as we did to install, which on a commercial street is significant. I remember the client calling us sheepishly the following season. Again, I felt like I was friends with the client. So when he called and I said, oh, hey, it's so good to hear from you. How did it go? And he just continued to say, well, you know what? You were right. And we want you to come back. Can you come and do our lights for us? And I was like, well, we can. But you remember, we had to increase the price. So let's meet. Let's talk about it. I think I even increased the price slightly more because that job was honestly so complex. It was hard work, really hard work, really hard work. And the organization on my end was like intense. At what point did you decide that you wanted to entertain selling the business? I always just resolved within myself that... If I was to do something, I would do it as long as it was enjoyable. And then I would probably reach a point at which it was no longer enjoyable. And then I would, I would change. It was kind of a scary idea to sell it because we had gotten used to the cash flow from the business and using that money to invest. And for a few years, I think we talked about it as an idea that we wanted to one day reach, but we didn't take any steps to actually get there. And then I think our 12th season was very intense and the business was still growing and we had kind of reached our max capacity for what we could manage. And 
the kids were getting older and you were out of state for a month and it kind of just started feeling like this is getting more and more intense. And I said, well, what do you think we could get for it? And neither one of us had a clue as to what we could get for it. And so the conversation would usually end there. Well, there was one year we were on our way to New Zealand and I was like, you know what? I'm just curious. Let's just find out if somebody can give us a valuation. So we have a clue as to what we're talking about and whether or not we can take this step. And I contacted the business broker and I said, we really just don't have a clue what our business is worth. And I was wondering if you can help us out with figuring that out. And we scheduled a call and he got all the information that he needed to. And then he got back to us with what he thought our likely multiple would be of our profit. I talked to Mark and I showed him and he was like, well, if we can get that, let's do it. And we were in New Zealand and COVID hit. It was spring 2020. And we were about to go live with our listing with the business broker. And two weeks before it went live was when COVID was shutting everything down. And I was like, well, there goes that idea of wanting to sell the business because you're putting up Christmas lights in places that get people to gather. I was like, we're going to get a hit this year. Our business broker was like, let's just, you know, we'll list it. We'll see what happens. And he started fielding calls and he vetted people before he would schedule Zoom meetings between us. And we started getting offers. We got offers from private equity groups, from bigger businesses that were offering to swallow us and our team into theirs. And we got offers from regular everyday people. And the process of selling in and of itself was also fascinating. And we ended up closing on the deal in September of 2020. I'd like to add too that we chose a time to sell where we were still energized by the business, right? If it didn't work out, we would have been fine running it for another year, another two years, another three years. Like we were making good money. So it wasn't a horrible, depressing time for us to be selling, right? We talked about that too. We were like, well, if we want to sell the business in five years, we might be really at our wits end, just kind of done and tired with it. And then we won't want to run it the next year. It will be more of a pressing need to sell it. And I think people would be able to sense that. Yeah. Whereas we listed it and we were very transparent with the people who we met with and said, it's very likely that our amusement park clients won't be able to operate this holiday season. And everything was pretty smooth. I'm so happy that we started the business. I'm so happy that we grew it. And I'm also incredibly thrilled that we sold it. And it is still continuing to operate under the new ownership. And they're doing a phenomenal job. And they're bringing in new technologies to light up sides of buildings in ways that we couldn't and creating immersive lighting experiences that we talked about doing, but that we also didn't do. So it's exciting to see that we built this little baby and handed it off and it is still thriving. If you're still listening in, thanks for being here with us. These are the key lessons that we learned in owner operating our business. Be open to trying and don't let others' opinions carry too much weight. If we had backed away because friends thought we were chasing an empty dream, we wouldn't be where we are today. If you are operating a seasonal business and want to increase profits, offer incentives to your clients for having the work done out of peak season. Go above and beyond to provide the best service possible with customer satisfaction at the top, and your reputation will grow organically. Be honest and be kind. For seasonal businesses, calculate your customer retention rate, and this can help you forecast anticipated growth and streamline your operations accordingly. Incentivize your team to keep on working for you because there is an added value in not having to train new employees. Look for people who have done things that you want to do and ask their advice. Don't burn bridges. Even if a client doesn't return, you want them to feel welcome to come back at a future date. Treat your clients how you would want to be treated. Give your team annual exit interviews so that you can use the feedback to improve. Build a connection beyond work with your clients and team. It's okay to know them on a personal level. And in fact, this can make work and communication more enjoyable. Respect each member of your team for who they are and what they bring to the table. 
Develop efficiencies, distance to jobs, minimizing unproductive time, ways to handle inventory, and things like this that will help you grow and become more profitable. Lastly, learn how to problem solve and how to build relationships. If you enjoyed today's episode, please rate and review and share it with a friend. I release a new episode every week, so come back and check it out. 